We're back with the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's a fast conversation here. It's World Health Day. And uh, today is, like I mentioned earlier on, the World Health Organization will be celebrating 75th anniversary because in 1948, countries of the world came together, founded the WHO. The essence was to promote health, keep the world safe, and save the vulnerable. But has that been the case? So for everyone everywhere that can attain the highest level of health and well-being, now, today is a great time to look at our public health as a country. That's Nigeria and as a continent, as a globe as well. Uh, the successes that have been improved uh, upon in terms of the quality of life during the last seven decades and uh, the shortfalls as well. Uh, at this particular point, it was also stated that um, the theme for this year's event, uh, that's the World Health Day 2020, uh, three is the health for all, which highlight the significance of universal health coverage for individuals worldwide, particularly in developing nations like Nigeria. Uh, we have a guest joining us this morning. He's the Nigerian country director at the One Campaign in the FCT, Stanley. Uh, and not true. I hope I got that well. Achonu. Stanley Achonu. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Then uh, we also have Dr. Samuel Okirin Day, who is a public health physician in Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Uh, Dr. Okirin Day, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So let's delve straight into it. I'll start off with uh, Achonu. What is the significance of today, especially when we look at our public health, uh, you know, the health sector for us as a country? What are the successes and, you know, what are the failures that we can actually reflect on? Um, thank you again for having me and uh, compliments of the holiday season to everyone, uh, to your viewers as well. Uh, today, uh, as we commemorate the International World Health, World Health Day, uh, is a significant day considering um, the myriad of challenges that we face as a country in our health sector. Um, we have some of the um, worst health indices in, in the world, uh, but we have also overcome some of the most challenging health issues uh, that the world has been confronted with. Um, you look back to uh, Ebola, uh, when Ebola hit, Nigeria was one of the countries that successfully managed uh, that out outbreak. Uh, we also did uh, tremendous work in managing the uh, COVID, the most recent uh, COVID outbreak, uh, where while the world projected that uh, the number of deaths uh, on the continent, uh, especially in countries like Nigeria, would be tremendous, Nigeria was able to overcome uh, that challenge and avoid the worst uh, outcome in health. Uh, we we have we have some of the best um, uh, health experts. Uh, and health workers in the world, um, if, despite the challenges that we, we face. And when you go around the world and you meet Nigerian doctors, they are some of the best doctors in the world. Um, only the challenge is that we are not able to harness uh, these human resources that we have uh, on our hands to make sure that we deliver the best of health care to our, to our citizens. But so today, uh, we look back to, to the progress that we have made. Uh, we have uh, started uh, health um, uh, health insurance scheme for the poor. Uh, we have we are delivering uh, uh, improved primary health care to to attend to, to tackle health challenges faced by the poorest of the poor. Uh, but we still face tremendous challenge, and that you know, for the size of the country, there is a lot to be done. Our secondary and prime and, and tertiary health care needs a lot of attention. Funding remains an issue, but. Um, in all of this, there has been some progress that has been made, but there is a lot more to be done uh, for us to get the quality of health that serves, uh, delivers the best to our citizens. Mm. Uh, let, let's, you know, speak with uh, Samuel this morning, Kirin Day, doctor who's a physician. He's practicing in Nigeria. I, I'd like to share your thoughts. How do you feel uh, today? The day that celebrate that's well healthy. What's the feeling for you? Are you excited? Are you sad? What's the emotion? Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I want to say um, I'm delighted to be here. And um, today, of course, you know, is World Health Day. A day set aside to um, by the World Health Organization to highlight the important um, issues or the challenges um, 
and sometimes also the successes that we've had in the public space. Uh, I want to, you know, your earlier speaker, Stanley, said a lot about um, how I feel about Nigeria. Even though we've recorded um, some successes, I, we must always say that because it's not just that you keep, you know, talking about the negatives and you don't talk about the positive. Ebola, of course, for example, was one of the successes that um, Nigeria was able to record. Um, then COVID-2, um, of course, as opposed to what was, um, you know, uh, postulated or, um, you know, uh, thought that would happen to uh, Nigeria, so even Africa, Africa and Nigeria was able to, you know, put himself together. And that's to let you know that there is indeed potentials if we're able to announce um, all the resources or if we're able to put our act um, together. Africa, Nigeria has a lot uh, to do. And so if you ask me, I would say it's more of a mixed feeling, not necessarily uh, while happy for the successes that we have. I would say that when I look at the gaps and the deficits that we have, it's really something to ponder and think about. Mm. But I'd like you to speak to it because you're uh, a practitioner. I mean, right here. Uh, what, what are the challenges uh, so far? So good. 75 years WHO will be celebrated. They have existed. But I, I'd like to ask you specifically, what are the challenges in the health sector in Nigeria that you have experienced firsthand? Okay, so if you want to talk about the challenges, you have to want to put them close to um, the indicator, the indices. And like as Stanley said, Nigeria really, we're not doing well when it comes to those things. Let's start with um, the um, framework for having a... Um, a functioning healthcare system, okay? Um, there are, WHO gives about six building blocks, okay, in the framework. And the first one, of course, is service delivery, where you have to talk about, the one of the indicators is number of hospitals, you know, per population. Nigeria has over 200 million people, and from the um, Ministry of Health website, we have less than 40,000 health facilities. Now, this is include primary healthcare centers, special hospitals, and, of course, um, the private setting, 40,000. If you look at it to the population, you find that that is grossly inefficient. Of course, the next in, uh, in, uh, in the next um, building block talks about healthcare workforce. Uh, healthcare workforce has to do with the, your doctors, your nurses, uh, to um, the population that we have. Nigeria currently has less than forty thousand doctors. Of course, if if you look at the register, you see that a lot of people with this Jaguar syndrome and Brindis syndrome. You see that we are actually also not doing well, as opposed to WHO seeing one physician to 600 people. In Nigeria, you see one doctor seeing more than 4,000 patients, which, of course, has led to more people leaving the system because there has been cases of burnout and all of those things. So in health work, healthcare workforce, retaining our healthcare workforce is another big issue. And like Sally said, Nigerian healthcare um, doctors, nurses, are well sorted out all over the world. Why? Because they are quite brilliant and they are very industrial. So when it comes to retaining um, our health workforce or motivating uh, in one of the indicators for you know for assessing your workforce is how motivated are they? Okay, do they have the resources, do they have the equipment to work with, do they have the right quote and unquote work, positive work environment at this things, they are they happy to come to work to to work. A doctor will have to see hundreds of patients every day. And still also in the same salary that has not changed over time. You know, that, that kind of person really can give its best. But when they leave the environment and they go to an environment where those things are there, you see that they outshine every other person. So when it comes to health workforce, there's still a lot of gap. Okay. And the other one has to be another building block is financing, healthcare financing. Of course, uh, I, when, whenever I talk about this, I'm saddened, you know, because, um, as opposed to other budget, other things they budget for. For example, Nigeria this year budget over six trillion for subsidy, oil subsidy, which even despite the subsidy, we are not able to assess the commodity. They still use, but look at health. The amount that has been budgeted for health has never gotten to to seven percent. As opposed to the Abuja declaration that says where all head of state came to Africa, Nigeria to be signed Abuja in two thousand and one and said. Minimum we should budget for health is 15%. Nigeria has never, ever gotten to that level. And of course, if you don't pump money into health, the outcome will not be, will, will not be right. So if you look at all of these things, you know, um, training, uh, I think that it is still a lot um, that, uh, that begs to be done, you know, still a lot of gaps. Yeah, so, so Stanley's here now. Stanley, do you, do you agree with him that, you know, uh, framing 
policy formulation, you know, framing and what have you, other issues, personnel, uh, lack of funding, might also be the challenges that the, you know, the health sector in Niger faced with. Uh, I totally, uh, Dr. Kennedy is, is spot on in his analysis. Of course, he, he is in the field, he sees um, uh, these issues. Um, and his analysis is, is quite right about the state of Nigerian uh, healthcare. And, I, and I'll give, uh, and let me re emphasize one point he made about allocation to health. It's not just that uh, the allocation to health is poor, it's also that the, um, the distribution of this allocation also makes our quality of healthcare service delivery challenging. Uh, a bulk of the health public health allocation goes to tertiary and secondary health institutions, ignoring the building block of health system, which is the primary health care. What that has translated to is that uh, health issues that can easily be managed at primary health care centers are now taken to the secondary and tertiary institutions, thereby overwhelming health workers in these health institutions who should be attending to advanced health issues. I'm sure Dr. Kennedy understands uh, what I'm saying. Um, if you have malaria, there is no reason why you should go to the general hospital. Your first point of call should be the primary health care center in your area, right? And same for other um, you know, regular minor health challenges that people face. Um, we should have a system where advancement to secondary and tertiary health institutions should be by referral, right? But what we have at the moment is that if I have a headache, my first destination is the general hospital or the teaching hospital. These shouldn't be things that uh, health centers at that level should deal with. And the reason why everybody heads in that direction is because of the way, even in the small health uh, allocation that we have right now, the way it is now distributed has led to level of inefficiency, thereby overwhelming the entire system, right? So we need to, in, in advocating for additional health resources, which I agree with Dr. Karen, uh, uh, Karen there as well, we also need to um, be more efficient in, in distributing this allocation in the health system in such a way that it, it leads to better uh, health outcomes. We are also, we are, we are also a country that our health system is quite expensive. I know this sounds, um, you know, uh, it sounds like, oh, we're not paying anything. You know, when you ask people, they say, oh, our health system is, is subsidized. No, we, we actually have uh, uh, an expensive health system, uh, both at the federal and state level. The, the out-of-pocket expense for an average Nigerian is quite high, right? When you compare it to the affairs elsewhere, our out-of-pocket expense for healthcare is quite expensive. It, it then redirects resources away from other things that people can tackle, right? And then there was also, uh, and I know Dr. Okay did mention this, our workforce management is very poor. And when I say workforce management, it starts with payroll. You know, the wages are, are extremely poor. They are delayed. We we have, we are constantly forcing our doctors to go on strike to be to be paid properly. No, if, if health system is priority for us. Our doctors, our health workers should not be subjected to the kind of treatment that we see them go through every year when there is cost of there is need for cost of living adjustment. They are forced to go on strike to get, get that basic cost of living adjustment. We tend to treat them as as a set of people that should just accept what they are giving and make the best out of what they are giving. You know, for the kind of work they do, they need to be motivated. Our current uh, wage system for our health workers cannot keep them motivated. I, I, sometimes I worry about their mental health. It, it has to be a lot to watch people suffer and die every day for, for things that you can handle, but you do not have the resources and equipment to tackle those things. So we need to be more sympathetic to our health workers because they face a lot of challenge. It's not that, they, you know, people tend, tend to say, oh, health workers are wicked. No, you need to look at the environment in which they operate. You need to understand the kind of uh, equipment and uh, environment in which they are forced to manage the world uh, health uh, industry. Mm. Promotion is always a challenge. Areas payment is always a challenge. Infrastructure in which, in the environment where the work is terrible. So, the health, the uh, education system is also becoming very challenging well, well, for them, of course. And there's the challenge of corruption in the health 
in the management of the scarce resources in health. So there's just a lot of challenge that our health workers face. Every no, no, so but, but quickly, I mean, for the want of time, because in no time, we'll probably may just, you know, call this a wrap now. But I'd like to ask you, Stanley, the WHO uh, has specific functions, the reason they exist, and today, mm -hmm. 75 years would be celebrated. Do you think that uh, the WHO has lived up to expectation? I mean, when you look at Nigeria and Africa as a content in terms of, as a continent, by the way, in terms of uh, promoting health, keeping the world safe and the vulnerable as well. Uh, these are some of the key objectives of the WHO as an organization. Uh, for instance, <laughs> COVID-19 and its vaccine, especially for Nigeria and Africa. Um, so, uh, again, um, WHO plays a complementary role to what our own government should, uh, should do or, or does with respect to health. Um, they have always provided the policy backing and support that countries need. In fact, if you need the best of information around Nigeria health uh, system, you will rely on WHO more than you rely on Nigerian uh, government. So they provide the necessary technical support. Um, with respect to COVID, it, it was an eye-opener for not just Nigeria, but for, for low-income countries. Let me not say Africa, because we tend to think that the most challenges are in Africa. But well, COVID opened the eyes of the world to the inequality that exists in the world that we live in. Uh, where, uh, when vaccine was made available, when vaccine was uh, discovered uh, for manufactured for COVID, uh, the rich countries bought up supply, bought up the entire supply, running into three, four, five years, while the poorer countries were left hanging without any so any any uh, vaccine supply. There, there was also the inappropriate pricing where uh, the vaccine manufacturers were selling to the highest bidder, leaving low income. There was that uneven on uh, lack of fairness in who could access vaccine. That's how we ended up with um, the rich countries not turning vaccine distribution into a charity. Uh, oh, U.S. have donated this million number, number of millions of uh, vaccine. Uh, Spain has done this. U.K. has done this. You know, we shouldn't have been in that situation if WHO has put, had put in place a fair system of distribution of, of, of vaccine. And I know, and I'm not, this is not to blame WHO because they did call out the unfairness. They did put mechanisms in place to make sure that all countries are able to assess, assess this. There was a lot of criticism of WHO, especially in the run up to, uh, to this, in, in, in the days, uh, leading to, uh, to and after the COVID uh, outbreak. But we also should recognize that uh, that there was a lot of effort to weaken the institution, the WHO as an institution. And we must, they, they are a trusted source of public health advisory globally. And weakening the WHO as we saw during COVID, questioning the experts' opinion, uh, questioning the policy direction they were giving, did not help in managing COVID. And, and I think that this is something that needs to, uh, what leaders need to think through about how we treat um, international institutions such as WHO. Where did they fail in some aspect? Of course, there was a lot of uncertainty with COVID. There was a lot of uh, a lot that was unknown with COVID. Did they try their best to make the best of policy recommendation? Yes, they did try. Did it lead to the best outcome? Sometimes it failed. Uh, as with every other human institution. But I think that they continue to play an important role. Uh, they have saved the world uh, a lot of times. Um, they have also learned lessons. They've set up health emergency centers across the world to monitor a potential outbreak. They are doing better in terms of uh, changing the discussion around uh, access to vaccine. Right now, Af they are working with the African government to make sure that we no longer have a food system where... Um, vaccine access is now restricted to a few countries. Uh, we need to take a pause there and let's get back to Dr. Okerinde. Okerinde, I'd like to bring this to you. If you don't already know, I want to assume that you know already that uh, there's a bill that has scaled through the second reading. It is to prevent Nigerian trained medical or dental practitioners from being granted full license until they have worked for a minimum of five years in the country and has passed, uh, like I said, it's passed a second reading. It's just to, you know, ensure that people don't diakpa, you know, within your sector. Uh, how do you describe this entire bill that has gone through the second reading? Okay, Rinde. All right, thank you once again. Uh, I must say that um, 
you know, one of the things that, um, one of the building blocks I was going to talk about is leadership and governance, okay? Um, and very, very important in that building block is political will, policy, and all of those things. And we can see that um, there is a major problem with our health workforce. And what are these problems? Workers are not well compensated, they are not motivated, and like Sally said, there is no remuneration. You know, their basic um, allowances are not paid. You have to go on strike uh, before you can get those things that uh, you are entitled to. All right? And of course, no infrastructure, there are still doctors, you know, there's still there's a lot of burnout. And the response to that, instead of, you know, um, improving the welfare in them, um, um, giving them, for example, motivating them. There is a reason why those people are living, what we call the pull factor, all right? You have the push factors. There is no job security. There is no loan facility. They are not happy. And then to further worsen the system, instead of you attending to those basic things, the, all we could think about is stiffen them, take away their fundamental rights. There is, there is, there is a, there is free movement. There is, there is, um, um, workforce um, mobility, you know, and all that the government can think about other than solving the problem is like cutting a head, you know, because of an, because of headache. Instead of looking for what the problem is and solving the problem, I think it, it's indeed an unfortunate situation. And I must say at this point that it is not only doctors or health workforce that are living. We have even other people in the banks, you know, we're having, you know, we're having like an epidemic. People in the banks, engineers, professionals in other fields are living. So if all that our Senate could think about, our House of Rep could think about, instead of putting legislation that makes life easy, better, um, creating more medical schools, improving that um, their wages, all you, if all you could think about is that legislation, I think it's really an unfortunate situation and I don't think the outcome will be nice. What that would do is to further demotivate health workforce. And they will say they are not, I mean, you can't force them to come to work. They will resign. And maybe they will go and start selling pepper or sand or something that will be able to take care of their needs. So I think they need to uh, look into that law or that bill that is just passed a reading and it should be, it should just be killed. That bill should not, should not move further. Mm. I, I can't. I think that uh, Stanley also needs to share his thoughts on this one, especially yes. when you know you are the country director at one campaign uh, with policies like this. Uh, before this, I'd like to ask what are the contribution of your organization, you know, to the healthcare sector in Nigeria, development of it, and also what are your thoughts on this recent bill that has killed the second reading automatically just to pit down, you know, those in the medical sector, put them down or tie them down, as it were, uh, so they can't, you know, jackma in the words uh, that we have, you know, coined for ourselves, leave to other parts of the country. And some people think that, hey, there's a rationale behind that, that you can't be training, we can't, you know, afford to train our doctors with our resources and then have them, you know, to go out and work for other countries. Um, someone, someone said that, Talents go where uh, uh, the resources are available, and that is what what has happened to Nigeria health system. The talents are going where they can they can put their talents to use and be rewarded for that that talent. You cannot train uh, a doctor, uh, provide them the worst uh, 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 environment to work in, and then expect that they will remain in that environment when there are places where they can deliver quality and then also be rewarded for it. So, um, I, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, we, the governance component of our health is, is sorely lacking. Um, the quality of thoughts that we see from, from the leadership is also sorely lacking. If this is, of all of the myriad of challenges, there's a reason why people are leaving the health system. And when you, when you make a long list of the challenges in our health system, departures from the health, system, from, from the health sector we rank very low. Right, there are maybe you would have listed 10 things before you get to the point of doctors are departing as a challenge, and you then leave all of the ch challenges at the top and then tackle the one that is, 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 the, is the least of the problem. Because once you solve the problems at the top, this one will stop. Um, you know, so it's unfortunate that this is the quality of thinking we are seeing uh, as, uh, as providing governance and leadership for our health sector. Really, really uh, unfortunate, and I hope that. Um, there is a rethink. Uh, the question I, I, I was speaking to a friend when I read about this news, and the question we asked him, if you say that they cannot be given license to practice until after five years, 
what would they be doing in the five years? Are they going to be practicing without license? I, look, there's there's just a lot of questions to be asked about this uh, this kind of thinking, and I, and I hope that um, uh, cooler heads step in and and give uh, the House of Rep appropriate uh, recommendation on, on how to tackle the challenge facing health. Definitely not this approach. Uh, in terms of what we have done uh, as an organization in health, uh, we have been here for a while. Uh, we joined other um, um, NGOs working in health sector. We, we collaborated with Health Sector Reform Coalition, a coalition of uh, NGOs working in health, to champion for the passage of the Nigeria Health Act, which is the foundation on which uh, the Nigeria health system and legislation and governance is built on. Um, we, in, in championing for the passage of that law, uh, we have since then, when since the law came into effect, we have championed for components like the basic health care provision fund. We spent two years pushing the federal government to make that fund, which was covered in the in the na na national Nigeria Health National Health Act um, uh, as well, making that operational. And it took two years of campaigning to get the federal government to commit to funding to uh, 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 making that fund operational. Uh, in the last one two years. We, since the fund has become operational and is dispersing funds to primary health care centers, okay. we are now focused uh, on Stanley, actually, making sure that it we have delivers to... the most quality to people. Mm. I, I really don't want us to just go away. It's uh, World Health Day. It's not every other time we have the opportunity to talk about mm. these issues. Uh, so, Achonu, let's take a breather with you now and uh, speak with Dr. Okerinde. Okerinde, what policies, uh, what statement, what exactly do you think the focus should be uh, on this particular day? I mean, I like the fact that it's World Health Day. It gives us the opportunity to talk about all of the issues and what's the way forward. What are the policy formulation uh, direction? What's the what are stakeholders expected to do at this point in time? You know, to ensure that we have a better society and better healthcare system. Okay, so what? what um, the, the theme for the World Health Day basically talks about health for all, uh, which is basically calling all actors, you know, all stakeholders to ensure that there is universal health coverage. You know, and. What we know is that the best form of healthcare delivery or healthcare system it has to do with PHC, primary healthcare, which um, um, which basically is is the bedrock. It's very critical to achieving universal health coverage. So we are saying that number one, the policy should be that the government should invest massively in primary healthcare. Okay, it, that is that has been said, you know, as way back as the you know, uh, Amaata Declaration and the Asana Declaration in 2018. Is, is, is there. Number two, let's, let's, let's localize some of these things down. Practical one, there need to be a policy that bans all public orders, all politicians from going out for healthcare services. You know, instead of putting a policy that enslaves or hold back healthcare professionals, doctors, let's put a barrier to say all, all public office, from the president, right, to the list of public officers, do not go out to seek care so that they can see um, the decadence or the rot that we have. If they have to stay back, then they will be willing uh, to invest. There have to be policy about training and retraining. There have to be policy about, like it's also said, the problem about the financing, you know, the, the renumeration, the compensation. And I must also say that one of the reasons why doctors, health workers are leaving is because they are also not secure. We've had several doctors that have been killed why they are providing healthcare services to the populace, to the people, you know, because there is no facility, you know, or there is no infrastructure to take care of those things, of those people. Then they, 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 the people take it on the doctors, and they, they, you see doctors being stabbed, doctors being kidnapped, even other health workers. So we need policies that will ensure that doctor, doctor securities um, are, is ensured. And so just look at those all the issues that we have raised, improve their uh, remuneration, improve their, their, their working environment, have more infrastructure. So we're talking about the distribution. If you go to the rural communities, they are living, they are, in short, they are practically we, disparity. We, we have to go in now. facility. And so, I am I am very saddened that I have to let you go, really. And that's because we have to join the next guest for our conversation. But uh, Stanley Atronu, uh, thank you so much for being part of the show. He is the Nigerian country director at One Campaign in the FCT right here in Nigeria. Thank you once again. And Dr. Samuel Okirinde, 
thank you so much for also making our time to speak out, you know, and talk about, you know, the challenges of the health sector in Nigeria. We look forward to, you know, having this conversation, you know, in the next couple of days or thereabout. Uh, he's also a public health physician. He practices in Lagos as a university teaching hospital. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being part of the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, then. We take a break. When we return, Monday Thomas joins us this morning on Friday to talk about sports. We'll be right back.